Our next speaker is Ali Thomaseb. He's a general partner at DCVC, an early stage deep tech venture capital firm with over $3.5 billion of assets under management. You're gonna learn a lot about growing your startup from Ali. Come on up, welcome. Hello. <laughs> Good to hey. see you. Thank Hi, you. Good here's to see your you. clicker. Fantastic. All right. Hello everybody. Good to see you. Have you are you enjoying the show today? Awesome. So my name is Ali Tamaseb. I'm a general partner at a venture capital fund called DCVC. Uh, short for Data Collective, we used to do lots of data infrastructure types of companies back in the day. Started about 13 years ago in the Bay Area. Um, we are we are kind of you know we're blessed with many successful stories. More than 15 unicorns. We manage about four billion dollars. More recently, in the past seven, eight years, we've been investing in deep tech. These are companies that solve complex engineering or scientific problems. Um, using AI, I'll go into how we define deep tech, but DCVC is generally a deep tech uh, venture capital fund. Um, some examples of our portfolio companies, um, we have you know, some IPOs, uh, including Epcelera and Recursion Pharmaceuticals in the, in the biopharma space, Planet and Rocket Lab in the aerospace and uh, Defense Evolve in the security space, Elasticsearch and Confluent in data, and a number of private companies like Agility Robotics in Warehouse Robotics, Freenome, again, in Medical Diagnostics. You probably have used Single Store in Databricks. Uh, you may have gone to a Carbon Health Clinic um, and Brimstone and, uh, in the climate space. So it's a range of companies, but the, the way kind of the, everything stitched together and how we define deep tech is you start with kind of machine learning AI, you know, it, it started from our thesis with big data and you need lots of high quality data to, to get to machine learning and now to uh, AI and, you know, generative models. Then you apply kind of, you use all the proper proprietary data, your industry knowledge, you know, the specific kind of data that you have gathered through your devices or your machines or the way that you've set up this company. That feeds into heavy computational products. You know, you, you do lots of compute on it, and then this kind of manifests its, itself through real world kind of systems like robotics or a call center or a rocket. So that's kind of how we see this, this flywheel of deep tech rotating. This company becomes more defensible. The more data that they collect, the more the kind of the be better algorithms they become. They manifest them themselves through the real world, and then the, the machine learning gets better. So that's how we define deep tech. Um, in terms of industries, we invest in lots of different industries. Uh, the way the kind of we see deep tech kind of sees itself, you know, we've backed company, deep tech companies in manufacturing, in semiconductors, in, in biopharma, in aerospace, in, in cybersecurity, in mining space. So it's lots of different industries, you know, some of which are kind of very different from what a typical venture capital fund invests. Uh, we invest kind of less in enterprise SaaS or consumer or social products, more in kind of these trillion dollar industries that have been lesser kind of touched by uh, startups, and we would love to see more and more people try to build startups in these, you know, kind of old, massive industries that need lots of AI, lots of kind of deep tech problems. And there are two tailwinds that, that are pushing us towards needing these type of kind of companies. One is climate, you know, the whole kind of uh, climate change. This is requiring us to build more companies to, be, to have, you know, carbon negative construction and mining and, you know, and lots of other industries. And the second one is the world conflict. Uh, obviously, if you're hearing the news, this is not a new thing. It's been going on, but that requires, you know, us to invest in security and cybersecurity and everything else that comes uh, with these kind of problems. Um, you know, this, this embodied AI, this AI plus industry insight that I talked about kind of manifests itself again in robotic excavators, in autonomous trucks, in robotics that are working in warehouses and in logistics places, in drones that are used for defense, in sensors that could be used in the mine site, or in pharmaceuticals and using robotics for drug discovery and pipetting and, you know, automating the process of discovering a new drug. Um, I'll talk about kind of quickly about four kind of recent uh, portfolio company examples. Uh, we invested in a seed round of Mosaic ML, which is in the you know, infrastructure for generative AI. It was acquired by Databricks, our kind of older portfolio company, for $1.3 billion. Today, we announced our investment in Reality Defender, a Series A company. Uh, they do generative AI detection, so there's lots of companies working on generative AI. This company detects generative AI. Uh, so if someone uses generative AI to, to spoof a voice and call a bank or create fake images or, you know, videos to, to spoof governments or, you know, send fake documents, this is the company that catches that with very high accuracies. Recursion Pharmaceuticals uses AI plus lots of data that they collect through their autonomous, you know, robotics that pipette and kind of test 
uh, different doses of drugs to discover the next generation of drugs. They have five drugs in the clinics being tested on humans. And PlotLogic uses AI and specific type of cameras uh, to be able to detect uh, the quality of the ore or gold in a mine site, in a gold mine site or an iron ore or copper that helps increase the efficiency of mine sites. You don't need to do chemical testing on every inch of that mine site. Um, what I want to talk to you about today is actually not, not our investments. It's, it's about a project that I started about seven, eight years ago. So I was a founder like you. I was on the other side. And when I became a VC, the first question that I asked myself was, what is it that actually leads to successful companies and successful outcomes other than luck? You know, luck plays a, you know, a big role. But other than that, can we actually say what is it that, that, that helps companies become successful or not? There's not that much data around this. So I decided to collect the data. It took me about five years to collect what is basically the largest, most comprehensive data set ever collected on venture-backed startups. This is 65 data points, including one-third on the background of the founders, one-third on the companies themselves, what industries they come from, what type of a problem they solve, what is their IP situations, what type of a competitive landscape, all the way to the traction, when they raise what round, how much time between each of them, how much, what valuation. Putting this together for all the venture-backed companies of the last two decades, that gives us the largest data set ever collected on VC-backed companies. 1% of which are successful unicorns, 99% of which are kind of didn't get there, unfortunately, that's the reality of startups. And we now have data to be able to compare them across these 65 data points, unicorns versus random set of venture-backed companies. And these are not just random companies, these are random venture-backed companies. These are companies that were able to raise money, but never became that kind of large success that they, they deserve to go. Um, I also interviewed lots of founders of unicorns, founders of companies like Affirm, uh, Brex, Cloudflare, um, you know, Instacart, PayPal, many of these founders plus investors put the whole thing together uh, in a book uh, published about two years ago, it was a best-selling book. And today what I want to talk about is the learnings that I had from doing this data project. Um, so when you imagine, you know, a, a unicorn founder, uh, when you think to yourself, you know, an image of a unicorn founder, you, you know, it might be Mark Zuckerberg, it might be Bill Gates, um, or kind of, you know, these large companies, founders of Stripe. Um, typically, you know, a young college dropout or, you know, someone in, in their early 20s that are working on their next set of companies. What percentage of, of these kind of billion dollar unicorns do you think are in the same situation? What do you think is the average or the median age of a unicorn founder when they started the company that became unicorn? Do you have any guess? 40. 40? 40. 36. 36. Any other guesses? 50. 50. Okay. 20. So if you average them out, we probably get, get to the right place. This is the age distribution. So 34 is the, the median age of a founder of a unicorn, the day they started the company that became unicorn. So depending on different waves of companies, you know, 10 years ago, lots of people would have invested in that kind of, you know, the 20-year-old college dropout. In the 90s, it was the 50-year-old, the gray-haired kind of founders. As time shifts, you know, these, these cycles change. But Eventually, you know, that the kind of the 20 to 23 year old, the kind of the, the very young founder that has just come out of college or is the dropout is only 4% of the unicorn founders. The rest, these are kind of people who have gone, started kind of working in, in a company, maybe started a company before, and then they start the company that becomes a unicorn company. But very interesting insight, when I compared this distribution between the unicorns and my random sample set, these are the venture backed companies, actually age doesn't matter. So this distribution is the same among venture-backed companies and the unicorns. So age is a non-factor when it comes to deciding what leads to successful companies. Being younger or older doesn't really matter. Do you know who this guy is? It's Eric Yuan, founder of Zoom. Um, this is a solo-founded company. So Eric Yuan started Zoom on his own. How many, what percentage of unicorn companies do you think are started by solo founders? 60%? 10. 30. Okay. 45%. Okay. Well, with all the stereotypes and you, you, you've, you've applied to different, different incubators and accelerators and all the people advising you, you know, you have to have co-founders, you need to, you know, start companies with co-founders. It turns out one out of every five unicorn is started by a solo founder. Now, that's less than two co-founders. That's the most common thing. Three co-founders is the next common thing. 
but then, but then it is solo founders. And then again, you compare this distribution with the distribution of my random group, so the companies that raised venture capital funding but didn't become successful, again, number of co-founders on its own is not a contributing factor to success. So you could be successful as a solo founder, you could be successful with five founders, you could be successful with 10 founders. What matters is how the roles are kind of distributed, who has the final say in authority, is there a real strong CEO in place, are the other people kind of you know strongly working with them? So one thing, what one kind of one piece of advice that I have from this kind of thought that the number of co-founders doesn't actually matter is you need to be able to hire the best people that you can. So if you have to call somebody a co-founder to be able to attract them, do it. You know, if if you are able to kind of attract someone that's very strong to your team to be and start this company uh, with you, even if you start a company one year before them or two years before them. It's possible, lots of people have done it, give them the co-founder title. The most important thing is just to attract the best team that you can around you. Um, this person, this founder is Ari Beldergren. He is founder of Kite Pharma, which was acquired by Gilead. It's a biopharma company for $11 billion. Um, he was at the kind of basically the pinnacle of academic success before starting this company. He has a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, a PhD. He was a professor. He was a head of their department. He was won you know, many, many awards in, as an academic and then started this company. And it wasn't your typical biotech company where the founder gets replaced by the CEO. He actually remained as a CEO of a biotech company as an academic, as a university professor. What percentage of, you know, if you think about the, the degree distribution of unicorn founders, what do you think is the most common degree among unicorn founders? Undergrad. Undergrad, okay, yes. So that's the most common, you know, among the graduates of venture-backed founders. So it's undergrads, followed by MBAs. There's lots of people who say bad things that MBAs don't help you. Actually, it turns out there's a little bit of a slight advantage uh, for, for MBAs as unicorn founders. Uh, then it's master's degrees, PhDs, you know, all the way down to kind of, you know, the, 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 the PhDs. There are people who studied law, there are people who just, you know, dropped out of high school, there are people who dropped out of undergrad. But your typical kind of undergrad dropout story, that's again, the very rare story, a few percentage. Most people, you know, they just finished a bachelor's degree, they went and worked, they maybe started a company, they failed, did something else, and eventually started that billion dollar company. These are the regular stories that, you know, it's shared among many founders. It's nothing kind of special around being, being kind of the, the dropout story. These dropout stories typically become famous because that's what the media wants to hear. You know, it used to be, you know, this 17-year-old founder started such and such company. These are things that get media, but that's not the reality of how billion dollar companies are started. They're typically started by professionals who have some work experience, who started companies before, who have become executive as a companies. This is professional business. Um, there's a little bit of advantage to technical founders, this is true. So among the billion dollar companies compared with random set of venture back companies, the technical CEOs overperform by, by a little bit. It's not that you have to be a technical CEO, half of unicorns are started by non-technical CEOs. So you can still succeed as a non-technical CEO, but technical CEOs had slight advantage. When you look at the second person in charge, this is typically the CTO of the company, then they are more likely to have been technical. And technical here, is defined with the industry that they have been. So if it's a biopharma company, it's not being a coder, it's someone that has a degree in chemistry or medicine. Um, so there's a slight advantage to being technical on the field that you're developing, but not a huge advantage and you can still win and be successful if you're a non-technical CEO. Um, these founders, this is Nat Turner and Zach Weinberg. These are the founders of Flatiron Health, a company that was acquired for $2 billion. Um, this is in the pharma world real world evidence, kind of data on what drugs on, works on what type of cancers. How many years of work experience in the pharma industry or in the medicine industry do you think these founders had? Zero. So that is not, you know, what do you think that, you know, typically what do you think is, is the norm in, in that kind of an industry? How many years of experience should a founder of a unicorn did have in that same industry? Ten. Two. Uh, again, hearing lots of different numbers. So it depends based on industry. So in healthcare and biotech, actually they were not the norm. Most successful founders in healthcare, biotech, generally deep tech industries have experience in that same industry, right? But when you look at enterprise and consumer, 
most of the founders, the majority did not have industry experience. This does not mean they did not have work experience. Again, the median age was 34. They typically had about 10 to 12 years of work experience before, but it was not necessarily in the same industry. So it's possible that a founder may go from a data infrastructure company and then start something in the you know, insurance technology or go from a consumer product to an enterprise product and still be successful. There are lots of other things that matter that we'll talk about. Um, Lots of successful outcomes, again, come from very good founders that kept changing the idea, pivoting the idea. And changing the idea depends on you know, lots of different ways. You could narrow things down, like Instagram, which started as Bourbon, which was kind of like Foursquare. It had lots of features. They removed all the features down and just stuck with, let's just share photos, and that's how Instagram became successful. Or you can kind of completely change the idea and follow the users, Anyone can guess this was the logo for what company? YouTube. YouTube started as a video dating website. You were supposed to upload your video talking about your interests and what you're interested in. Lots of people didn't want to go on, on their internet and talk about you know, their interests. So they uploaded their cat video and uploaded something funny as, as a way to manifest themselves. And that's how the founders kind of got the clue that this might be more, they, they may need to go more general. So pivots is not always about going deep, kind of narrowing down, sometimes it's about kind of following the, following the users and kind of going more broad. Um, so that was YouTube. And then, you know, in terms of, you know, sometimes companies work in different cycles. So Webvan didn't work, but, you know, DoorDash worked. Kind of the same idea, different timing. So sometimes, you know, technologies and type product companies go through different cycles. Sometimes they're not successful in the first cycle or the second cycle. Eventually, the cycle catches on and these companies become successful. So you need to understand the type of company that you build, what, what cycle number of that technology are you in? Are you building a quantum computer? This might be cycle number four, that three, three previous cycles have been you know, failure. So you need to understand why the previous types of companies have been failures. And when you look at kind of the charts, actually most of the successful unicorn companies were not within the first five companies that try one idea. Most of them were kind of after many successful or many failure, failed companies within that space. Kind of Google is the most, most kind of famous example of this, but it's very true that you can still build a successful company even if you're not within the first five. It does not mean if you copy a, comp you know, a competitor, you're gonna be successful. Um, I'll talk about that later. One of the things that do matter to successful companies is where you worked at. That's kind of the brand that you build, the network that you build. Working, having worked at a tier one company like Google, like you know, at, at that time, kind of Yahoo and IBM for the older company. But basically, having experience working in a tier one branded company does actually help you become successful in in being able to create a successful unicorn company. Um, again, when you look at the competitive landscape for these companies. Many of these billion dollar companies were competing for share. That was, they were not the first to market. They didn't create a market. They went into an already existing massive market and they were competing for share in terms of kind of getting, getting a successful outcome there. Um, one example of that is Flexport. You, you all know kind of uh, this company in the, in the kind of logistics business, in the forwarding business. There's many, many companies in that space, many of them smaller companies. Uh, some of them are the incumbents, and Flexport became in and kind of became a successful example here. Um, again, when you look at the competitive landscape, most of the successful unicorns are the ones that are competing with an incumbent. So today, your odds are if you're competing with the Cisco's and the Oracle's of the world, or maybe with the Google's of the world, rather than another highly funded startup. So if there's another startup that is raised $250 million and you're copying them, your odds of success is actually less likely because you're following them. But if you go after a small sliver of what Salesforce is working on, it's actually more possible that you're gonna succeed. Um, anyone know what this is? This is an old image. <clears throat> exactly, so this is the million dollar homepage. This is a project that uh, Alex Tu uh, started. This was basically a million pixels that he would sell for I think a dollar a pixel uh, to advertiser. To advertisers, this became such an interesting project that lots of advertisers started buying them. I may spend a hundred dollars on putting this there, and Alex basically made a million dollars by creating this kind of random. You know, this was not a company, this was not a startup. It was a project. He sold something of value. Now it doesn't make sense, but 15 years ago, this kind of somehow made sense. He got lots of press for it, and he made some money about it. 
time went on, he started a company that failed, he joined a company that failed, eventually he started what became Calm, which is a unicorn company, and you know, that's actually a similar story when you look at the patterns of how successful unicorn companies and founders start. Many of them are not first time founders, they've started previous companies, many of them have failed before. Repeat founders do have, and it's not about repeating, you know, I have started 20 companies before, it might be one. I started a company, spent three, four years on it, raised some money, it didn't become a big success. Next time around, you're actually more likely to succeed. So look at this kind of as a journey. This is your career as a founder, and your, your first company or second company not, may not be a successful unicorn. It might be a small exit or it might be a total failure. It's the next one where you're gonna be more likely to succeed. That's the story with the founders of Uber, Travis Kalanick and Garrett Kemp. Travis started Red Sush. Um, he spent many years on it. You probably have read stories about that, that company. Eventually, after many kind of failed uh, failure modes and he, him saving money and trying to save this company, it was acquired by, for $19 million by Akamai. And Garrett Camp, he started StumbleUpon at that time that was acquired for $75 million. So these are big numbers, but these are very small numbers for VCs. No VC is going to be very happy about a $19 million exit. But that's exactly what leads to successful unicorn outcomes. That's a very repeated pattern among unicorn founders. You start a company, you go through lots of trouble, it may take you four or five years, you end up selling that company for 10, 15, 20 million dollars. You, you've worked at the place that acquired you and then you start your next company and bam, that's your unicorn company. Again, this is a journey, this is not a sprint. Many of these unicorn founders had started a bunch of these smaller exits before. Some of them had as many as four small exits before they started their kind of unicorn company, some of them less, but again, this is shared pattern between them. So moral of story, keep on building, keep on creating companies. It might not be successful in your first try. Try to do it right, try to raise money, hire good people, find you know, customers. It might be a small exit, try to get to you know, a 10, 15, 20, 50 million dollar exit if you can, if, if it's not going somewhere. And then in your next company, you are going to, a lot, to know a lot more about how to play this game, how to pitch to investors, how to hire well, and that is going to be your unicorn. That's how most unicorns are started. The story of Zuckerberg is actually the anomaly and the most kind of, you know, storied example. Um, again, if you want to read more, you can go and uh, buy Super Founders. I go talk about all these numbers and data points on it. And yeah, that was it. Thank you so much and happy to answer any questions. I can vouch for the quality of the graphs in that book because it <laughs> resembled the quality of graphs in this presentation. That was awesome. Yeah, I have the book. Um, so we have time for maybe like one question. Yeah, We're sorry, running a bit behind. Yeah. That's okay. Okay, let's take your question. Hi, it's it's Allie or Ollie? Both are fine. Okay, great. <laughs> Um, Lulu Waters, I just want to take a second and thank you for leveling the playing field on these thought lines because going through an early, very early stage accelerator, having done some work with Jason and his founder, you, his very early cohort, just being out in this world for the time I've been here, it's incredibly confusing. You get told a lot of things. We get a lot of whiplash as founders, and I really appreciate you taking the time to kind of level this out and, and just normalizing the experience of a very abnormal experience of being a founder. So thank you for being you, I appreciate you. Of course, oh, that's thank great. you. great, okay, we'll take more questions with the next speaker, sorry about that. Of course. Thank you so much, I'll take thank that. Thank you again, thanks for being here, take All care. Right. Thank you.